It's a great pleasure to be here with um, Mr. Rajiv Malhotra once again. As he said, we've been friends for now 25 years or so, and I met each other sometimes here, sometimes in the U.S. And I followed his, uh, well, almost one-man battles on a variety of issues, which are of great interest, uh, I think, to the future of uh, Sanskrit studies, of course, as he has emphasized in this particular book, but really of our civilization as a whole. And I think that, um, as uh, Rajiv correctly pointed out, in India, a large number of people, and in particular the traditional scholars, are uh, usually unaware of the criticisms that are being made abroad. Now, of course, there are occasionally people who praise what we've done, what we do, but that is widely known, but the criticisms are not so widely known. And now it's a time, once again, that's why we must thank Rajiv for pointing this out to a large Indian audience. It's time, once again, to see that another kind of uh, colonialism is developing right in front of our eyes, and uh, we are not aware of it. <clears throat> and this comes from the studies that have been made by some very prestigious uh, scholars in the United States. And uh, I've had a chance to look quickly through Rajiv's book. I must say that I've not read it fully at all, but I read it here and there, wherever it seemed to me that there was something that I should uh, make a mention of. And uh, I think it's something which everybody should read. Not only those who are interested in Sanskrit, certainly they, all of them should read it, but even others. I think it's very important to be aware of what's being said and what really actually is our position. So before I come to the point that he raised about the Charvak and so on, Charva, Charvakas and so on, I must make one general point about India which has actually disappointed me a great deal um, over the last several decades, which is that our educational system is really basically the one that the British set up. It's still very colonial in character. In spite of more than 60 years now, it's after we became independent. But we have not really taken a square look at the system that we need. It rarely represents an Indian point of view. There may be something about Mahatma Gandhi and a few others. But what has been the traditional Indian viewpoint? What, what is it that has survived in India? A general appreciation of what happened in India is unfortunately woefully lacking. I've seen even people who are otherwise highly educated, ignorant about what was done. And I can tell you any number of controversies that have occurred in this own country, this, our own country, where these issues have not been appreciated at all. Let me give you just one instance and I will uh, go on to the other subject. Uh, all of you know that last year uh, in the Science Congress in Mumbai, not the one recently in Mysore, but even there it happened. Uh, the sessions were, there were sessions on the history of Indic science. And many things were said there, which unfortunately were not, uh, were not did not represent, uh, an, uh, uh, what do you call, a reasoned judgment of the situation in India. Uh, but as, as interesting as some of the extraordinary and false claims that were made in that meeting were the extraordinary and false rebuttals that came in the press. So we have here two things, you see. Uh, in, in the meeting in Bombay, people came and claimed all kinds of things which we know not to be true. They forgot to claim all those things which are great, are true. And here is the press, which is from one point of view almost as ignorant as uh, the other people who said these things and can't distinguish between what is true there and what is not. And I can give you many examples of that. The claim was made that we had uh, aircraft flying at Mach 10, certainly not true. And my colleagues at the Institute have made a detailed study of that claim. The claim that uh, the Pythagoras theorem was actually known in India before Pythagoras of the Greeks is true. There's no doubt about it. In fact, there's no reason why it should be attributed to Pythagoras at all. 
because uh, he never wrote anything about it or about its proof. It was only 500 years after he died that somebody started attributing the result to Pythagoras. This is not a Hindutva view. This is the view of uh, very learned scholars at Stanford and in Germany. They said that uh, Indians had no plastic surgery. Not true. There was, actually. And I have uh, sort of gone through all of that and produced the original verses from Susruta where it said, and what is more, as late as 200 years ago, the British learned how to put your nose back if somebody had cut it off, largely from the Indians. Now, the point here is that these are not controversial issues among scholars at all, but this knowledge has not has not seeped into the minds of a large number of our people. I keep meeting young people very often, and uh, I, 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 I talk to them about what I think happened in India, in terms of science and technology in particular. What is, uh, what is being misrepresented there by exaggerated claims, and what is actually more important to what has happened in the world than we assess. Both things are there. We are downrating. You see, take for example the numeral system. Everybody knows that the numeral system came from here and it's acknowledged by the whole world. But it stops there. It stops there as if some Indian found some trick about numbers, writing numbers, and that was very influential. It's widely accepted, but it stops there. It does not. It doesn't stop there at all. It is a fact that actually this number system changed our conception, the world's conception of mathematics. It changed the conception of what mathematics was in Europe. The mathematics that we attribute to Europe and that we learn in school and college here is the mathematics, apart from Euclid, that was triggered by the ideas about numbers and algebra and equations that went from India to Europe. And uh, I can, if anybody is interested, you please send me an email. I'll actually send you why I believe that. But uh, the young people, like going back to the young people, they're very curious to know what is the truth in all of this. They, they're, they're bombarded by conflicting views and they have no idea which is right and which is wrong. And when I talk to them, what I find out is that there's a hunger there for knowledge, which our educational system ought to be provided for, but is not. And I think that this is actually a great weakness in India. So people grow up and in fact get highly educated in some specialization, but have no general view of what happened in India, what its impact on the rest of the world was. We know what the impact of Western science on our world has been, but the rest of the world, but ourselves, we ourselves do not know it. So I think that it's uh, very important to take a very close and critical look at what's happening, what has happened in Indian science and in um, technology. The debate with the West of the kind that um, has to be conducted starts with one big disadvantage, and that is the words. We have to translate words. You can, I, I see this every day in the newspapers when the things, are, things come out in English, discussing concepts which are really Indian and for which there is no truly uh, precise translation in English. It's the same way the other way around too, from English to our own language right from such common words that you hear every day, religion, communal, secular, you know, democracy. These, these words have meant, have no uh, Indian equivalent because those were not the concept which drove our civilization. Our civilization was driven more like concepts like dharma and uh, knowledge, jnana, and of course, there were other things too. It was not, there was, there was no politics or economics. There was Kautilya, for example. But when you start translating these concepts from one language to another, uh, the debate gets confused. So one of the major suggestions that I'm going to make to all of those who are interested in these issues is that when you write something in English, keep the verbs and possibly the adjectives from the language, but some key nouns must really be taken, even adjectives perhaps, must be taken from our own language and used as such without translating them into English. We should Sanskritize or indicize English spoken in India, written about in India, and not fall a victim 
to arguing about concepts which are alien to our civilization, where in fact the view that has been taken in our civilization is actually, in my view, still superior. Let me just give you one example. Um, well, I don't know, there are people speaking many different languages here. What is the word for religion in India? Well, what is the word for secularism in India? Well, for secularism in India, the official translation is Sarva Dharma Nirapeksha. Well, first of all, it uses the word dharma there. Dharma is seen as equivalent to religion. Dharma in India is not equivalent to religion at all. It transcends religion. Similarly, what is the word for religion? Well, in Kannada, I went to a school long ago where Kannada words, Kannada was actually still widely spoken, I would say. And we all read Kannada books. What is the Kannada word for religion? It is Mata. And what is Mata today? Mata is the boat you give in that pole. Okay? When they count that, they say so many Mata. But there is a connection there. Mata is a view. Religion is not just a view, it's much more than that in, in, in the Western languages. Why, we, why do we say Mata? Because we instinctively accept different Matas. Just as you accept different Matas as possible when you go to vote, India accepts different religious views as natural, is not unnatural. This is a view which is very different from what's been held in other, uh, in especially in uh, Western civilization. It is incidentally, by and large, an Eastern view. Uh, not only in India, even if you go to China and to Japan, it's very hard to pinpoint what the religion is. One Japanese friend of mine always used to say that he was born like a Shinto, he was married like a Christian, and he would die like a Buddhist. So what is the religion? What is this religion? He says, what is my religion? I don't know, he said. You, you speak. I want to come back to the question that uh, Rajiv raised about the Charvakas and about science in India. Once again, I think there's great confusion here. The methods that were used for uh, science in India were not the same as what the Greeks adopted. At first, when I first started my studies, I thought this was something that the Indians didn't know about. As I continued my studies, I slowly discovered <clears throat> that although it was not called the Greek view, that view was, was uh, rejected after consideration. For example, the Indian objection always was to Euclid. They never, they were never, uh, they never argued with Euclid or the Greeks. But if you go to that method, well, you see it's based on hypotheses. And we don't know, the hypothesis may be right or wrong. In other words, how do you know that the axioms are right? You say, I do this axiom, and I go by two-valued logic to the conclusion. And they would say, well, how do you know that logic is two-valued? How do you know that your axioms are correct? That view would have been revolutionary uh, even 100 years ago. But in the West, as with the other subjects that he mentioned, the view is changing around now. And people see that you can't rely entirely on axioms. And that uh, that may not necessarily be the best way to go about doing uh, your science. In uh, India, our scientific reasoning, reasoning in general, always put observation or pratyaksha first. The Charvakas said only pratyaksha. Okay. But the systems which came after them, like the Sankhyas, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Nyaya, for example, Vaisheshika, and so on, a total of six systems. See, in India, there's not a single view. Uh, it is a civilization. It's not a religion. It's not one nation. It is a civilization trying, if you want to put it that way, to be a civilizational state in a world which has been very intrusive. India has not been intrusive in the rest of the world, but the rest of the world has been intrusive here. So we have been trying to make a civilizational state out of an ancient civilization, one of only two which have survived now for four or five thousand years, there's no other in the world. And I see that our friend, uh, uh, Mr. Pollock, when he talks about uh, civilization and nation, he talks about civilizations which has come out of nations. Well, the, the concept of nation is only 150 years old, and it's entirely European. We ourselves have fallen prey to it. We always think of India as a nation. India is not a nation. 
India is actually a civilization. The Supreme Court understands that, but our politicians and our journalists still don't understand that. We are, however, a civilizational state. And the concept of a civilizational state is quite different from the concept of a European nation state. Nation state has a border. It has a language. It has a religion. Well, in India, there's no sharp border. There's no one language, and there's no one religion. So going back to this issue, the reason that uh, the Charvakas eventually failed to gain acceptance in India is that they depended only on observation, pratyaksha. The general argument in India was, OK, pratyaksha is OK. It's very necessary, important. It's the most important evidence on which you can base your reasoning. But if you limited yourself to pratyaksha, you cannot argue about the past. You cannot predict the future. How can you predict the future? How can you predict the position of that planet if I said I am only doing it by observation? Observation is necessary, but not sufficient. This view turned out to be so successful in India that the Chavakas were forgotten. They're there still. And as he said, they were smart people. It's not that they were stupid. But the view slowly began to be rejected. But even then, Observation and pratyaksha were the first. And that was true among the scientists and among the spiritualists. The spiritualists began with observation, jnana, their own experience, anubhava, as very important. And the scientists started there. The philosophers started there, but went on to include, first of all, what's been called uh, anumana in India. For those Kanadigas who always think of anumana as suspicion, you must, I must emphasize that anumana is a technical Sanskrit word. The meaning there is not suspicion. The meaning is inference. Okay? But in that word inference, two things are mixed. It's a reasoning process. But it's not a reasoning process where you arrive at the absolute truth. You may not. Inference may not be absolute truth. Okay? But it helps you predict the future. It helps you understand the past. From this point of view, the Indian approach to science and knowledge was very practical. I say that because, once again, all these new uh, people, this, uh, what did you call them? This new group in the United States, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is trying to be uh, the dispenser of knowledge of uh, India to us, that group does not realize that um, the Indian view of many of these things was extremely practical. Now, when I say that, people are at first surprised. There was one thing in uh, India, even in Indian philosophy, you look at the old books. Uh, there is an argument, always. And the argument can even, can even be between the Sishya and the Guru. And the Sishya was perfectly justified in asking the Guru, tell me why I should do this. The Guru had to justify why he had to study that subject. Let me compare that with an instance from Euclid. Euclid teaches geometry. He, he taught geometry like a, you know, like a coaching class today. You had to come there and pay fees, and you could be his student, and he taught you geometry. So there's one student, there's a story. There's one student who comes there, and at the end of the day, he says, Mr. Euclid, what's the good of all this? And you know what Euclid does? He doesn't answer that question. He calls his slave and says, this man asked me what geometry is good for. Return his money to him and send him away. <laughs> I don't want to talk to him again. So you can see how different these views are. So reason was never banished in India, even on adhyatmic matters. That we must understand. Recently, a friend of mine gave me a copy of Gaudapada. Now, I had heard a great deal about Gaudapada and read a little bit about him, but I had never actually seen his work. And so I started reading it. What fascinated me was it was in four chapters. The first chapter is basically the Vedic view. What do Vedas say? It sets it all down. But the interesting begins in the second chapter. In the second chapter, it says, well, I've told you in the first chapter what the Vedic view is. Now, from now on, I'm not going to depend on the Vedas at all. I'm going to depend on pure reason. If you don't like the Vedas, that's a different matter. But now my argument is pure reason. And I'm going to describe to you in the next three chapters. It's basically um, what you may call a discourse on an Advaitic view, an Advaitic philosophy. 
before Shankara incident. He was actually Shankara's guru. So, in some sense. So reason and religion, or spirituality, 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 were not beyond reason. Our views of those things had been very different. So the next three chapters are about a reasoned view of what the Advaitic position is. If you look at science, <clears throat> the man who first uh, said in science that inference is also important was Charaka. Charaka said, we can't do it, observation is very important, but it's not enough. We must actually go by inference, we must use reason, and we must use reason, and we must convince other people. We must convince other skilled doctors that we have actually a cure for a disease. Without convincing other people, you can't say this is science yet. Well, that's a very good definition of science, and in some sense valid even today, as it was at that time. So whether you took a spiritual text, whether you took science, whether you took mathematics, it was A, based on evidence, B, based on reasoning, although the reasoning was not exactly the same as in uh, Greece and Europe, based on a consensus, which is very much the position today in the world. And so it's very hard, I find it very hard to um, say that our uh, systems were not rational. And it's actually not even difficult to find this out. You only have to read the Aryabhati or Brahmagupta. Brahmagupta is a different case. I, I don't want to mention Brahmagupta just now. You have to read the Aryabhati to find this out. So, my time is up and I actually have to be going. What I would like to suggest is that it's very important for us to be able to take part in these discourses, to put the Indian position correctly, but critically, not without arguments among ourselves. It's important that this must be a part of our educational system. It's important that our educational system must be changed so that science, the humanities, the social sciences, arts are all in the same campus. We, we have very few in universities now. The universities were supposed to do it. And uh, the universities which used to do it once upon a time are no longer in the same position. I'm a great advocate in this country of setting up new universities called Indian National Universities. We set up IITs, we set up IISC, we set up NITs and all kinds of things. We need some national Indian universities where uh, the Indian view is common knowledge among all the students who go there. This is not to say that things should not be criticized. <coughs> Criticism is as old a component of thought in India as uh, it is anywhere else in the world, perhaps more. You see, when people, people talk about Hindu views or Indian views, but that make a distinction between those and Buddhist views. Well, that, that's really uh, totally wrong. That's why I like to use the word Hindic. Buddhist is as Indic as what the foreigners have called Hinduism. We did not give that name. It was given by foreigners. And the different philosophies that we have, the wide variety of them, Indic is not one. It is many. It is very diverse. It's as diverse as our linguistic environment in this country. Just as we used to the language changing if you go 100 kilometers. You must also be used to the philosophy changing if you go to a different community. So we must understand this uh, diversity in our country, but critically look at them. Uh, there's too much uncritical acclamation of uh, false achievements, just as there is an inadequate appreciation of the true achievements. We've got it all wrong. And I think that it's very important for us to do it. It requires a big effort. And in such an effort, I think people like Rajiv Malhotra are playing a pioneering role. They're pointing out what other people are saying, what actually has happened, and what we really need to do. And I think that uh, we are doing a great service to India. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs>